So thanks everyone for attending. Uh, today we're going to do uh, something a little different from our previous webinars we focused in the past on, on kind of higher level topics. Today we're going to dive down a little deeper into um, the subject of laser cooling um, for quantum atomics. Um, so our, our, uh, we've got some upcoming webinars that we hope you, you join us for. We're going to be talking in, in future subjects on ion traps and atomic clocks and more to come. Um, but we assume that you're, you're here for this webinar because you caught the quantum bug and you want to learn more about, uh, about quantum atomics. Uh, and you'll notice that today we're doing a slight, something slightly different. You can see my face, which uh, is, is great that we thought we'd try and make this, this whole thing a little bit more personal in times of COVID. Um, and so the, if you want to be in the quantum world, it helps to be cold. It, help, it helps to be at, at low temperatures, which is why we've named our company Cold Quanta, because the best quantum particles are the ones that are cold. And the reason that that helps you out so much is that at high temperature, quantum, there's a couple of reasons. One is that at high temperatures, quantum particles uh, don't really behave quantum-y. They, they behave more like classical, classical um, balls. They, they, we, we call it the billiard ball model often where they're just a bunch of particles moving around in free space. As you get to low, low temperature, something interesting starts to happen. Um, according to old man Louis de Broglie, the, the matter wave wavelength is proportional to um, one over the square root of the temperature. So if you get to lower and lower temperatures, you get to longer and longer wavelengths, and eventually you get to the point where you can start uh, getting macroscopic quantum phenomena at, that are at scales that we as humans can comfortably interact with them. Uh, so that's, that ends up being something that's very helpful. The, the other reason is that if you want to be in, in quantum state matter, work with quantum matter, the quantum states are very fragile. It takes very little to disrupt them, um, which is why you see all of these systems that are, um, the, the superconducting groups always have these beautiful cryostats that, that are the, their, their little uh, superconducting gates are chilled down to sub, sub Kelvin temperatures and then the ion trapped world the, the ions are trapped uh, also using lasers um, in, in some some sort of a, some sort of a confining potential and of course neutral atoms all of the most interesting things that we do with neutral atoms are done in in confining potentials after we've cooled them down so today what we're going to talk about is how do we get there? What is the so-called, so, so to speak, the, what's the birth of the cool? And that's the subject of laser cooling. Uh, the, the goal of this, this webinar is to be not so much a, um, a, a, a targeted to experts on atomic physics. My hope is that if you, you are interested in the subject, but maybe not already a professional laser atom trapper, uh, that this will, this will help provide you with a somewhat intuitive understanding of how laser cooling and neutral atoms works. Um, and if you've been paying attention to our webinar series, you've seen this picture a few times. And that, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll know what that picture means and why we think it's an important one to show at the beginning of all of our, our presentations. So let's dive in and start with some building blocks. Uh, right, th right from the beginning, we, want, we gotta say, what is an atom? And how do we, how do we interface with them? We, we love to show these beautiful artistic renderings of what atoms are that make, make you think that they're very quantum and uh, there but there's a lot of different ways that one can think of a model our, our, the ancient Greeks thought of models as billiard balls that they had a uh, just the the atom was the fundamental unit of matter there couldn't be anything smaller and they were just little balls that would bounce around into each other over time it was found that that was not the best picture of how to think about it JJ uh, Thompson came up with what they, it was called the plum pudding model which I really like because it's Funny to talk about plum puddings in, in the context of atomic physics, but this was when they, they started to understand that there was some charge associated with the atom, that there were electrons that were coupled to the atoms, um, but they just said, well, there's some positively charged mass. Eventually, through through um, understanding atomic spectra and understanding some, uh, some uh, scattering experiments, it was understood that there's actually a nucleus, that there's a very, very dense section of the middle of the atom where all the positive charges stored and all the negative charges somewhere else. So Bohr wrote down this model where we said, okay, there's a bunch of bands and the electrons are allowed to live in 
different band, different energy bands, uh, and they can fill those energy bands, um, and that that describes a lot about the atom about atomic spectra. But it didn't quite tell the whole picture. So eventually, you had to go to a wave function model and describe the describe the behavior of those of those electrons outside of the nucleus in um, with with more. Uh, with, with a with progressively more and more accurate description. For our purposes, this is a little bit deeper than we need to need to be. We can we can actually get get some pretty good mileage out of the ball model, but we're going to sprinkle a little bit of bore on top of that. And we're going to put an electron, a single valence electron, floating around it. But I'm going to throttle back and just say that my valence electron only has two states. There's an excited state. And there's a ground state, and the energy splitting between them um, scales is this. H bar omega naught, uh, where omega naught is some frequency that's associated with with that transition energy. So let's think a little bit about what does it look like to scatter uh, um, light off these atoms. If I if I shine a laser at the atom, and my laser is far detuned from the resonance, so my 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 laser frequency here, um, which my laser pointer. So my laser frequency. Is at a, is is not at the resonant frequency of, of, of my atom, then nothing happens. The atom, the photon just whizzes by. But if I tune my laser frequency so that it's resonant with the transition, now the atom will tend to absorb that photon, excite that valence electron into the excited state. It will hang out there for a few hundred nanoseconds, and then it will emit a photon. The direction of that photon will be random. Sometimes it goes off that way. Sometimes it goes off this way. Sometimes it goes that way. Um, and so on and so forth. And photons are kind of funny little creatures. They have no mass, but they can carry momentum. Uh, so every every time my photon is is colliding with my atom, it's a uh, it, it transfers momentum to the atom. This is all. They can also carry angry momentum, and that's going to come up in a, a little bit down the road. Um, but the that collision is completely inelastic. So we can work out what the momentum transfer per photon. So every there's h bar k per photon, um, where and then the, the atom scatters off that, that photon. And when you average out all those rescattering events, it averages out to get about half a momentum photon per atom, which doesn't sound like much. And we can work out what that force is. We can say that the, the it's the change in momentum over change in time gives us the force. And we know the scattering rate of, of rubidium because we've measured it. It's about six million uh, photons get scattered per second, and so we can work out what that force is, something like 10 to minus 21 newtons. Doesn't sound like much until you think, oh, it's a rubidium atom, and it's only 10 to minus 25 kilograms. So that's something like 3,000 times the force of jet gravity, which is enormous. It's actually a very violent thing to do to the poor atom. So um, that's all great, but what does that have to do with temperature? We're talking about laser cooling. How do we get? How do we use applying a force to atoms to get cold? Uh, so remember, we can relate temperature to velocity. We're going to assume, and it's a pretty good assumption, that our atoms are pretty much an ideal gas, so we don't have to worry about them interacting with things that much. And it would, the, we can evoke the equipartition theorem and just say, here's a relationship between temperature and velocity. And so we so we can just say if, if we are going cold if we're colder they're going to be moving slow and that's that's our basic premise if we want to make them cold we have to slow them down so there's one more uh, bag th one more th trick that we need to add to our, our toolbox and that's the Doppler effect uh, you, whether or not you know it you're familiar with the Doppler effect because you've heard a car drive by you've been to a racetrack and you've heard the car go and the frequency changes as the cars coming towards you versus when it's going away, or an ambulance. Um, what, the, what this is is that as the, as the emitter is moving with respect to the observer, there's a compression on the side of the wave on the side that's, that, that is towards the, um, towards the direction of motion and, and an extension on the other side. So you, you, we call that the, the red shift as the object is moving away from you, and the blue shift as it's moving towards. I like to think of it as walking into the ocean. So if I'm walking into the water, um, the waves will hit me more frequently because I'm walking towards their motion. If I'm walking out of the water, it'll, they'll hit me less frequently. So, um, so great, now we have all the tools we need to get in to talk about laser cooling. Um, so let's dive in. 
let's suppose that we have an atom. We're going we're to confine ourselves to, to one D for now. And that atom is, has some motion. And we're going we're to apply two laser beams. And because it's experimentally easier, we'll, we're going to set our laser, laser frequency. Both of the, the beams are going to have the same laser frequency. So um, if, my, if I tune my laser to the frequency of my atom, it looks like it should absorb from both beams. Except that, because of the Doppler shift, it looks to the atom like the beam coming from, from the left side is blue detuned from resonance, and the beam that is co-propagating its motion is red detuned from resonance. So what I can do is I can detune my laser so that it is now red of the atomic transition, and my, my beam that is co counter-propagating the atom's motion will get tuned into resonance, and the co-propagating beam will get tuned further away from resonance. So that's great. Now I get a force on the atoms, which depends on the atom's velocity. I get a damping force. And I can, I can extend this into, into three dimensions here because the atoms, when, they, when you shine light on them, they're going to scatter light in random directions. So let's add two, two more sets of laser beams. And from three dimensions, I can now, I can now cool my atoms in, in all three dimensions, and I can get um, a region where the atoms are going to be cold, where my beams overlap. Uh, this makes the atoms cold. I can, I can lower their temperature this way, but it doesn't actually trap the atoms. And what I'd like to do is get the atoms, put them in a trap, and be able to do something useful with them and keep them protected from, uh, from negative influences from the environment. So we need to figure out how to make a trapping force. So let's go back to our picture of the atom. Atoms are ping pong balls, right? Well, no, it's not really, it's not really the whole story. Um, the electron has, it has a charge, and it's moving. It's orbiting around the, the nucleus. And so that gives you a magnetic dipole moment, just like if you have a current of a loop of wire carrying a current that generates a magnetic field um, that, that has its own magnetic dipole moment, so does the atom. So now my atom has an opinion about what way that electron is orbiting with respect to the field. And that results in what's called the Zeeman shift. If the, if the um, dipole moment is co-aligned with the field, the energy will shift, um, shift up, and if it's counter-aligned, it will shift down. Uh, and it will change um, how much energy I need to couple to those states. Um, also, I, I mentioned earlier about magnetic momentum. If my atom, if I have linearly polarized light, I can couple to this what's called M, M sub J level that has no angular momentum, where where the atom doesn't have a preferred orientation with respect to the magnetic field. But if I'm aligned one way or the other, I have to basically get my electron to orbit in the direction that, that is energetically favorable. So that means I have to couple either to a higher angular momentum state and, and bring circularly polarized light to the party, which for some reason, circularly polarized light is indicated with a sigma. Um, or if I wanted to go to a lower, um, a, a lower angular momentum state with respect to my magnetic field, I have to apply the opposite handedness or the opposite angular momentum state of my photon to the atoms to get it to couple. So, why do we care? So let's suppose that we add a magnetic field gradient across the atoms, and we're going to do something very clever, which is um, with, with our with our polarization states that we're going to make it so um, so that the beam coming from the right has uh, imparts minus one unit of angular momentum, and the beam coming from the left imparts plus one unit of angular momentum. So now, if my atom moves to this side of the trap, it will it will. Um, uh, tend to preferentially absorb light from the, the beam that's on the opposite side of the trap from the, from the field zero. So it gets pushed back this way, and now we'll tend to preferentially, preferentially absorb light from that side, and back to zero, and voila, now we've created a field where we have a trapping force that goes with, along with the cooling force. Um, so I can write that, I can write an equation down to describe that force. Uh, and lo and behold, that this actually works. This is a picture of a cloud of atoms that, that we uh, trapped in our lab using lasers and magnetic fields. You can see these are the coils that we're using to make the, uh, to generate the magnetic fields. Here's the little cloud of atoms. There's some optics floating around. And by the way, we haven't mentioned it, but all of this has to be done in ultra high vacuum because if there's anything other than a bunch of rubidium atoms around, it, it'll disrupt the, tr the trap. Um, and this, by the way, was done in one of the cold quantum minimod cells. You can read about that on our website if you're if you're interested. That we, we make these available as a, a teaching resource to people who, who want to 
do it, um, to do this in educational labs. So um, let's go over some housekeeping about about laser cooling. Or this is kind of the the stuff that you really need to know if you want to make your living as a quantum mechanic. Um, the the force on the moth I told you is enormous, thousands of g's. But there's some catches. If the, the, the actual, that's the, the most force we can apply. The reality is that the force kind of depends on, on what the, my laser detuning is and my power is with respect to the atom's motion. So if I, I can, if I, once I pick a laser detuning, I've kind of picked the velocity of the atoms that I'm, I'm gonna trap. So the, the fast, you know, in this, in this particular detuning, I'm, I'm optimizing, I get a maximum force for the atoms that are going around a meter per second for this calculation. Um, and so what that means is that I end up with kind of a threshold behavior where if my atom is going too fast, it doesn't experience much of a force from my, from my optical field and it just goes flying past the middle of the trap. Um, so I can only capture up to a certain velocity of atoms and that, that actually ends up being very strongly dependent on things like detuning and particularly beam size. So for typical good parameters where I might have a mod with a one centimeter beam, which is which is normal, uh, I, I'm gonna be limited in the case of rubidium to only being able to trap the atoms that are moving about 30 to 40 meters per second, which sounds kind of fast, but if you think about what's the velocity distribution of rubidium at room temperature, well, you'll notice my scale down here is in hundreds of meters per second. So if I wanna know, if I zoom in here on the the 30 meter per second tail, I'm looking at only like less than half a percent of the of the total number of atoms available to, to the game. And so everything else that's in the system is just kind of garbage that interferes with our trap. And so that uh, that prevents you from getting a large number of atoms in the system. It also prevents you from having long-lived traps because that because there's a lot of you need you need a lot of excess gas to be able to trap the atoms and use them. Um, so there's solutions to this, of course, that we can we can deliver only the atoms that have a useful velocity class to the mod. Uh, there's a few different ways of doing it. The most common way is, is uh, ways are one, one of them is called Zeeman slower, where I have a beam of atoms coming from from one direction, and I apply a magnetic field that gets progressively smaller and smaller, so that at this end of the of the tube, I tend to I tend to scatter the faster light on the faster atoms. At this end of the tube, I tend to scatter light on the slower atoms. This works really, really well. Uh, the problem is that that's really big. You know, it's kind of the size of a human for rubidium because because you can only scatter light so fast off of the atoms. Um, the other way you can do that is with a thing called a two D mod, where we do the mod. We use only those sl slower atoms in the trap, but we just use the mod to preferentially filter them out and get them out of the out of the chamber and into a lower vapor pressure region where we can work with them. Uh, and this, so this is a product from Cold Quantic called the Cold Atom Source Cell. And the nice thing about this is that it's really quite small, especially compared to the Zeeman slower. That's about, about what, uh, what the, the relative scales of the two, uh, of the two systems are. Um, but in both cases, the goal is the same. I've taken mostly hot atoms and I've isolated the hot ones from the, the place where I want to do the experiment. And, and delivered only slow usable atoms. So uh, I remember this whole story about the atom having some some dipole moment because the electrons are orbiting around it. Well, it's true, but it's actually I'm, I lied. It's still not the whole story. So sorry about that. We, there's a little bit more that we have to know to actually make this useful, and that's that electrons have this thing called spin. And spin, you can kind of imagine that it's the electron's a charged ball that's orbiting, that's spinning around its axis, and so it has its own magnetic dipole moment, and uh, that electron, that has that magnetic dipole moment can have some orientation with respect to the orbital angular momentum, uh, or the, the or orbital dipole moment, and that results in what's called fine structure splitting. So now this excited state, just on its own, can split into it has two options of states that it can go into without an applied field. And then my nucleus, by the way, also has spin. So that means that that can be, uh, then that can be some, some orientation with respect to the electronic orbular angular momentum. So I get splitting in the ground state, uh, in, in the ground state and further splitting in the excited state manifold. So it's gotten a little bit more complicated. This is what 
the typical energy level diagram for the for real rubidium looks like. Uh, and what we do is we, we cheat a little bit by picking a transition which for the most part looks like a two-state system. We couple from this, this f equals two to f equals three state, and because of something called selection rules, the atoms, when they decay, they tend to go back down to the f equals two level most of the time. There is, there is a mechanism by which the atoms can decay into the wrong state on this f equals one manifold. And it doesn't happen often, maybe once out of every 10,000 times. But that means it would only take a few tens of milliseconds to go dark, because remember, our atoms are scattering at something like six million cycles per second. Uh, so uh, we have to add in another laser. That, that's called a repump laser, which pumps, we, we excite atoms from the f equals one state back to some, one of the excited state manifolds that, that can then decay into f equals two, and it's back in the game. We can keep, we can keep laser cooling. Uh, so it's a, it's a reasonable question to ask, how cold can we get? How, can, how, how low of a temperature can we make our atoms? And uh, let's think about what happens to the atoms inside of them. I already told you that the atoms get pushed around back and forth. So sometimes the, uh, the atoms are going to keep moving while they're being cooled. So they're going back and forth, they pushed from one side of the trap to the other. This motion is commonly referred to as a random walk. For some reason, every statistical mechanics professor I've, I've ever had likes to make this metaphor of this being like a drunk walking around that uh, that they take a step and they forget which way they to walk before so they take another step in a random direction um, i don't know if the drunk metaphor may, says more about the students or the professors um, it's up to uh, up to somebody else to decide but uh, th we can using this statistical mechanic model we can calculate what the low end of the temperature is for laser cooling and for rubidium it ends up being about 150 microkelvin which is pretty cold, but not really cold enough to start to see, to see any quantum effects. So we want to be colder. Um, we, and we can do that by using a technique called Sisyphus cooling, which calls to the, um, the, the Greek myth of the, of, of the character that was forced to push a stone up to the top of a mountain, and every, every time he got to the stone at the, the top, the, the boulder would roll back down, he had to go back down and get it again and push it back up. Um, and so you can do the same thing using atoms because we are, we are using coherent laser light to cool the atoms. What happens is you get an interference pattern of the, of the laser light that superimposes onto the atoms, and you get some, a spatially dependent um, variation in the light shift of the, of the atoms. So as the atom's coming along, it basically rolls up the optical potential to a point where it can get scattered into um, into a slightly lower state that takes energy out and it does it again and again and you can get down to um, close to what's called the, the, the recoil limit so the energy associated with um, the scattering of a single photon and that's in the case of rubidium around 300 nano um, that, and that, that's cold enough to be quite useful and quite interesting but it's still actually not cold enough to really take advantage of quantum effects for that we usually have to go to some form of sub-recoil cooling um, this is often done by turning all the lights off and doing evaporative cooling. In the case of if you're making a Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, but there are there are techniques to get lower and lower energy levels, such as Raman Sieband cooling or velocity selective coherent population trapping. Uh, this is, goes a little bit beyond the scope of this particular lecture, but it's worth noting that these techniques are are commonly used in the field, and they can even be even used to, to laser cool atoms directly to a degenerate Bose. Bose gas, which is, a, a, um, this is work from uh, Vladimir Voltage's group at MIT. Um, so there are also a lot of other atoms. We've talked mostly about rubidium. It happened for no particular reason. It happens to be my favorite. But um, there's, the, all, there's a bunch of things that I've highlighted in blue here that are all the other atoms that have been laser cooled. And um, there, there's, it's worth thinking a little bit about what the difference is between these various atoms. This first column, the alkali atoms, end up being the ones that are kind of easiest to work with because you need only two lasers to laser cool them. The lasers are usually uh, are, are usually fairly convenient. Uh, so let's take a look, just for comparison, at strontium, uh, which is another very fashionable atom to work with right now. Um, so here, you remember our energy diagram for rubidium. You need two lasers, cooling and repump. Both these lasers are around 780 nanometers, separated by a few, a, a, you know, a few tens of picometers be between them. Um, and so you, it's a, so in strontium, the strong cooling transition is at 461 nanometers, 
And that's actually enough to start. You can make a mod with just 461 nanometer light by, by shining, um, by, by stimulating that, that, that transition. But there is a decay path me mechanism, which the atoms can decay in, into, into, into this other manifold and that will decay into a very long-lived state. So if I wanna keep the atoms into the game, I need to add in some, some more lasers. I need to have a, a laser at 707 um, and, and one at 679 so that I can pump these atoms back into this ground state so they can keep them in the game. And by the way, if, I, if I'm going down that road, I can also laser cool on the 689 nanometer transition, which is a very narrow line of the transition, and that allows me to get to, um, to a much colder mod. Uh, and if I'm going all the way to using strontium, I'm probably doing it because I want to do something with this really, really long-lived uh, strontium clock transition, which is what makes, which is what allows uh, some of the best atomic clocks in the world to be made with strontium. So, I'm thinking about just what the lasers look like. Well, it's two laser frequencies. They're both right around 780 nanometers. Um, we can buy diode lasers with sufficient power, we made with some application to um, from, from commercial vendors. To, to do this, it just have, have to put them together and stabilize them to an atomic transition. So it's it's pretty straightforward to get there. Um, strontium, well, the 461 line, 461 is a harder a harder wavelength to, to reach. So we either need, um, if we're going to do it with commercial parts, we have to do it with something from a frequency double uh, diode laser or maybe a TiSaf laser that's also been frequency doubled. But and you need a lot of power because that transition line width is so much broader. Um, if I, these repump lasers, I can get there with diode lasers, and um, it's not that's not so bad. But there's no convenient spectroscopic lines around that I can use to frequency stabilize them. So I need something like a transfer cavity or a high quality wave meter or a frequency comb to stabilize those um, those lasers too. The the red mod laser, it's a very narrow line width, so I need a narrow I need a narrow line width laser, which usually means I have to actively narrow an ECDL. So with a laser like this. Will do the job, but I have to do. I have to work really hard to get that laser to perform well enough. Um, and then, if I want to get down to the clock transition, now I need something like a one hertz line width. So I'm kind of you're, you're starting to push the envelope of what's possible with commercially available stuff. And it, at the end of the day, this kind of ends up being all about the Benjamins. It, in the case of rubidium, we're going to spend something like fifty to hundred k to, uh, to to make that that that. that laser system uh, using commercial parts. In strontium, it's going to be somewhere between 600 and 1.2 million uh, just, just to get the ball rolling and, and, to, and to get started on, on the laser system. So where do we go from here? We've talked a lot about how to make the atoms cold. Now that you've made them cold, there's all sorts of great stuff you can do with them. You can talk about making quantum states of matter. These are pictures of uh, Rubidium BC from the University of Colorado, or a mod insulator state from Jing Jun's group at the University of Chicago. Um, and then there's a bunch of applications that all become useful and interesting if you can get into, uh, if, you, if you're starting with a sample of cold atoms, the, the atomic clocks, the frequency standard that all the world's atomic clocks are referenced off of starts with a cloud of cold atoms made just the way we've described today. Um, if, if you want to make a gyroscope or an accelerometer, they can be enabled by being cold, same is true for, uh, for electric field sensors and quantum computers and all sorts of other quantum information uh, processing techniques that, that are being currently studied. Um, so thank you for your attention and uh, I look for, we look forward to your questions. No questions, answer, 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 answer. Um, by the way, please visit our website and uh, and uh, subscribe for updates and for uh, to get to get the first notice on future webinars that, that we'll be presenting through this series. Thank you very much for your attention.